series, Lone Black Driver. Walking with Wallace, fellow NASCAR drivers and pit crew members stand with Bubba Wallace on the Talladega track, a show of unity after a noose was discovered in the driver's stall this weekend. The FBI is now investigating. We'll talk to NASCAR team owner and former NBA star Brad Darty about the culture surrounding the sport after the banning of the Confederate flag. With COVID-19 infections and hospitalizations soaring in parts of the country, many public officials are considering or moving to delay reopenings. Louisiana announcing it will hold back from its next phase for at least another month. The Texas governor saying that COVID-19 is spreading at an unacceptable rate in that state. California is reaching a record number of confirmed cases as Florida now tops 100,000. President Trump's response to criticism over his Tulsa rally and the comment about testing that his team insists was a joke. The press secretary today defended the president's use of a racially charged term for the virus as we learn more campaign staffers have have tested positive for COVID-19. We'll talk to the campaign ahead. A New York City police officer has been suspended after a video was released showing four officers subduing a black man, one of them using an apparent chokehold. The police commissioner now calls the video disturbing. And child care, an industry that's essential to working parents, is now in crisis. Will the government step in to help? Good evening, I'm Diane Macedo in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin today with a grim record. The World Health Organization is reporting Sunday saw 183,000 new cases of COVID-19 worldwide, calling it easily the most in a single day. WHO officials say this pandemic is now accelerating and U.S. deaths are now over 120,000. Some places like New York are moving toward reopening with New York City entering phase two today. But as many Americans enjoyed the first official weekend of summer, COVID-19 continued to spread at an alarming rate in some states. At least half of the country reported a rise in cases on Sunday. Hospitalization rates are up in 19 states with records yesterday in Arkansas, Texas, California, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Arizona. And that's where our Matt Gutman tonight leads us off. Tonight, with more than 120,000 American lives already lost to the coronavirus, respiratory therapist Christina Santana is desperate not to lose more. I've never seen anything like this. Seeing people die, seeing people suffer, seeing people, you know, just having a hard time breathing. Tonight, 12 states hitting records no one wants their highest levels ever of coronavirus. In all, the virus rising in 23 states and Puerto Rico. Florida today topping 100,000 cases. Experts warning it could become the next epicenter. More than half of the new cases there, people under 35. And the point of infection for many, so similar. The sick individuals have all stated that uh, they've been around a pub, a bar, uh, an event uh, during the holiday weekend, those types of activities. They, they, when we call them, they're freely admitting that. And they say, yeah, my, my friend was at the same pool party. My friend was at the same bar. Florida, one of the last states to lock down and one of the first to reopen. Today, finally urging everyone to wear masks when social distancing is impossible. This is a real spike. This is a real trajectory. The battle over masks playing out in towns across the country. Officers in California escorting a father and his children out of a Walmart after police say he refused to wear a mask. The governor of Texas, who has pushed hard for reopening, today pushing masks. I know that some people feel that wearing a mask is inconvenient or that it is like an infringement of freedom. But I also know that wearing a mask will help us to keep Texas open. The state's infection rate doubling along with hospitalizations, now 3,200 a day. The mayor of Houston now worried. We are moving very fast in the wrong direction. And about two months after the virus ravaged New York, signs of hope. The city reopening barber shops and salons. Arizona also notching a record number of hospitalizations. Tents set up outside this Phoenix Medical Center. And nearly four months after volunteers raced to help on the front lines in New York, Yuma's only hospital now calling for every available nurse in the region and for volunteers. What happens if this surge, which we're in right now, gets worse and you have more patients? So we're also looking at other areas within the state of Arizona or even within the nation that we can bring in other resources of nurses. 50-year-old Garrett Craig says he was the first COVID patient to make it off a ventilator alive at this Arizona hospital. His 30-year-old son 
hospitalized with him. I was still going out, wasn't worried about anything. I made it a joke, to be honest. Father and son now warning others not to take this virus lightly. Social distancing is important. Wear a mask. It's a miracle that, that we're both here and we survive. And it is great to see them both there and seemingly doing well, Matt. Uh, Matt Gutman joins us now from Yuma, Arizona. Matt, what are you hearing from the doctors there about this rate of infections? Are they worried that the system might be overwhelmed? They are concerned about the system being overwhelmed. We are in the midst of the peak right now. Uh, so far, especially here in Yuma, it is under control. But if it rises substantially, they are going to first run out of staff able to uh, handle all of these patients coming in and then ICU beds, perhaps even PP PPE, which is why they're trying to bring in staff from outside the state to help out. And the rise in COVID cases also means a surge in people trying to get tested, which is why we've seen massive lines at testing sites. Uh, a 13 hour line in Phoenix, people waiting outside, Diane, for up to 13 hours in triple digit heat. And Matt, the president is headed there to Yuma tomorrow. Is that raising any extra concerns and are there any sort of special preparations being put into place? Well, there are a lot of special preparations. Uh, as a PIO, PIO just told us, you know, it's pretty hard to hide Air Force One in a town as small as uh, Yuma, Arizona. Population about 90,000 right now, and about 5% of that 90,000 have or have had COVID. So this is very much on people's mind. Now, the purpose of the president's trip, at least here, is to go visit the border wall. But the border wall is not really, or immigration for that matter, not really on the minds of most people here. COVID is on the minds. It is rising very fastly, uh, very quickly here. And that is what people are talking about. But still a very big moment for the town of Yuma to have the president coming in. Uh, lots of preparations in place, Diane. All right, Matt Gutman for us from Yuma, Yuma, Arizona. Thanks, Matt. Joining us now, infectious disease specialist and ABC News contributor, Dr. Simone Wilds is here. Doctor, thanks for being on with us. Uh, thanks for having me. So we are again looking at a very mixed picture across the country. Some former hotspots are starting to reopen, but others that seem to be doing pretty well are now seeing a surge in cases. Do we know why? Great question. What we have been seeing is that there are a number of different factors that are really driving these numbers. First and foremost, what we see is that, you know, some states have reopened prematurely. That means all the guidelines were not in place for them to reopen, but they reopened anyway. Then some states, what we find is that their regulations are different with regards to reopening. So you have them at different phases and certain things are not enforced. For example, I'm referring to masking. Some states don't require you to wear the mask for every kind of event and function that you're part of. So that creates conflicting information. And of course, we know that masking has been shown to help to reduce the spread of the virus. So that's a big problem. And then what we have, we have more testing. So more testing, we're gonna have more cases. And because of the more cases, we can isolate patients and we can do contact tracing. So there is a number of things that we see contribute to having these hot spots around the country at this time. Now, how much of these hotspots are being attributed to an increase in casing because of more testing and how many are actually increases in hospitalizations and deaths? Well, you know, what I should say is that, you know, some of the cases are asymptomatic and we're not having increased hospitalization in those cases. But then there are in other states, we find that we have people that require hospitalization, they need to be in the ventilators. So I think you kind of have a mixed bag with regards to things that you're seeing. And then by comparison, New York State is seeing a low infection rate now, and New York City moved to phase two of reopening today. Until there's a vaccine or an established treatment, how do we reopen in a city this crowded without risking a second wave? I think the big thing is it has to be a tiered approach. You have to look at the numbers. You have to see where you are before you move to the next stage, the next phase. So if the numbers are really high with regards to new cases, it might not be a great idea to move to the next phase. I think you have to do it in a staged approach. And another I know everyone wants to get back to you know the new normal, but I think you have to do this based on some science. 
It makes sense, but we are antsy, I can tell you from personal experience, and I'm sure we all feel the same way about that. Um, but we are also seeing, unfortunately, another concerning trend here, which is the increase in cases among young people. Is there a sense for why that's happening? You know, young people like to go out, they like to socialize, and you know what? They sometimes don't always follow the rules. So when they get out, they don't always um, practice social distancing. They're not always wearing their mask, and because of that, it creates problems, right? They end up contracting the disease. The big issue is they, their cases are usually mild. However, the issues are when they go home to their families, parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles, they pass the, the uh, coronavirus onto them. And because they, their family members have underlying medical issues, they end up in, with the more severe forms of the coronavirus and require hospitalization. So that definitely is very alarming for us. And now that it's officially summer, we're seeing reopening efforts, dressing, being outside, outdoor dining, that kind of thing. So what's your advice to people as they try to resume their activities? How different are the risks outdoors versus indoors and how differently do we conduct ourselves? So the great thing is it's summertime. When you're outdoors, we find that the viral load for the coronavirus is not as high as when you're indoor in close places spaces with a lot of different um, individuals in large crowds. So I would definitely encourage you to spend time outdoors. But, you know, you cannot do it without practicing certain things. Wearing your mask, continue to practice social distancing, continue to do good hand hygiene. This way, we can all have a good summer for as long as we can, but just make sure that we follow these guidelines with the structures that we have really tried hard to accomplish for the past couple of months. So let us do everything we can right now. All right, infectious disease specialist and ABC contributor, Dr. Simone Wilds, we appreciate talking to you. Always great. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we have breaking news from the Justice Department. A U.S. Army soldier is facing terrorism charges for allegedly planning a deadly ambush on fellow soldiers in his own unit. The suspect is accused of leaking details to a white supremacist group. And ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has more. Pierre, what do we know right now? Diane, federal prosecutors are calling U.S. Army soldier Ethan Melzer, 22 of Louisville, quote, the enemy from within. The FBI says Melzer was allegedly orchestrating an ambush on his own unit deploying to Turkey, providing critical details, including its location, numbers and weapons to the Order of the Nine Angels, a white supremacist group that worships Satan. Investigators finding this image of a knife in a book related to Melzer on his iCloud account, the plan allegedly diabolical. The London-based neo-Nazi group was to pass the information on to jihadist terrorists so they could attack the soldiers. Prosecutors claimed that when confronted during an interview with the FBI, Melzer, Melzer declared himself to be, quote, a traitor. Diane? All right. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Pierre, thanks. And staying in Washington, where President Trump today is drawing heat after saying at his rally on Saturday that he asked his team to slow down testing of COVID-19 because it made the number of positive cases rise. Afterward, the White House staff said he was just joking. So what's the president saying now? ABC's Terry Moran has the latest. At the White House today, they were scrambling to manage the fallout from the president's rally in Tulsa, the arena there only a third full after Team Trump promised huge crowds. Was the president happy with the size of the crowd in Tulsa? The president um, was very pleased with the rally. But the president had bragged that there certainly wouldn't be an empty seat in the House. His campaign crowed that a million people had reserved tickets. The pictures told a different story. And even Trump's former campaign manager said today this was not a good look. Look, I think a fundamental mistake was made. Overpromising and under-delivering is, you know, the, the, the biggest mistake you can make in politics. Even the Fox News Morning program questioned the wisdom of this rally. At the same time, we are at, uh, during a global pandemic, and I don't know who thought it was a good idea to put 20,000 people in a room and the, with masks optional. In Tulsa, the Trump campaign did hand out sanitizer and masks, conducted temperature checks, but six members of the campaign advance team tested positive for coronavirus before the rally. And today we learned two staffers who worked the rally tested positive afterwards. 
The president tried to use his 100-minute-long speech to turn the page on the pandemic, but then he said this about testing. When you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. His team quickly put out a statement that he was just joking. This morning, the president himself was asked about what he said. But did you ask to slow it down? Uh, if it did slow down, frankly, I think we're way ahead of ourselves, if you want to know the truth. We've done too good a job. More fallout from his speech, Trump once again using racist language to describe the virus. I can name Kung Flu. I can name... 19 different versions of names. The White House defended the slur by explaining what Trump was really trying to say. The president does not believe it's offensive to note that this virus came from China. And Terry Moran joins me now. Terry, the White House insists the president's comments on testing were tongue-in-cheek, but have they elaborated at all on why it would be funny to joke about slowing down testing? Hmm. That's a good question, Diane. The president was asked whether they were tongue-in-cheek. He said they were semi-tongue-in-cheek. Uh, he says it paints an unfair picture of the virus in America, these rising numbers. He's clearly sensitive about the, about the polit political implications of all this uh, and why it would be funny. They say, look, you can tell that the president is putting on a show when he's giving a rally, but public health officials do say one of the key defenses against this kind of pandemic disease is clear, consistent, messaging on public health measures from the very top. And President Trump does complain about the number of tests revealing the uh, scale of the virus in this country, and he doesn't like it. So it is, no question, a mixed message. And Terry, there was more reaction today to former National Security Advisor John Bolton's book. Some Democrats say that they'll investigate any further allegations of wrongdoing that are raised in the book about the president. So what is Bolton saying about that? And is this a road that Democrats can even go down again, given everything else going on in the country right now? Well, Diane, Bolton's being very cagey about this. He, he said, let's see what the Democrats do. And then he made the point that the way Americans change presidents uh, or take into account presidential misconduct in the usual course of events is through an election, and one of those is coming up in November. He clearly wants to put his book and what he has to say into the public mind and let them judge President Trump. He doesn't want to be part of uh, another impeachment. I don't think Democrats have the stomach for it right now. Of course, if there is genuine misconduct that rises to a level that, that a majority of the Congress says, the, you know, disqualifies the president from office, they'll do it. But right now, I don't think you hear Nancy Pelosi or any leadership in the House of Representatives saying anything about impeachment. And Bolton doesn't want to play. Diane? Terry right. Moran from the White House. Thanks, Terry. Thanks. For more on the president's rally in Tulsa, I'm joined now by Trump campaign communications director Tim Murtaugh. Tim, thanks for joining us. Sure, happy to be with you. So you said today that the campaign's headcount was over 12,000. The fire marshal reported a crowd size of roughly half that, 6,200. Either way, not the 19,000 the arena holds. Now, having expected an overflow crowd, how did the president react to the lower turnout? I think the president understands that what uh, what happened was we had more than a week's worth of just a barrage of negative news from the entirety of the mainstream news media telling Americans that uh, a Trump rally was just about the most dangerous place you could be in, in it because of uh, the virus and because of the uh, supposed uh, expected violent protesters. And uh, the mayor of Tulsa put out a statement saying that he had information that there were outside groups, organized groups coming in to create unrest. He had business owners in the middle of Tulsa had boarded up the, the windows of their businesses. It really looked like a war zone. Uh, so the fact that 12,000 people still came, I think, is a testament to the enthusiasm behind President Trump's uh, re-election campaign. And I think if you contrast that to Joe Biden, 12,000 people is approximately... 11,990 more than Joe Biden had at his last event. And so there really is a huge enthusiasm gap uh, between President Trump and his campaign and Joe Biden and his campaign. The enthusiasm gap is real and it is wide. I notice you attribute it, the, the health warnings to the media, but in fairness, health officials also sounded alarm on this event. Tulsa's, Tulsa's health director said that they urged the president and the campaign to postpone. Dr. Fauci himself said that he would not attend such an event. So is there any effort to rethink how you do rallies in the future, given we are still in a pandemic? 
Well, the president is eager to keep getting back out on the campaign trail, and, and uh, you know, a lot goes into planning a, a rally, and uh, lots of different factors are considered. It's one of the reasons why we chose Oklahoma. Oklahoma is just about the most open state in the country, and they're far along in phase three of their reopening. That's why we were in Tulsa in the first place. And uh, I can't help but remark upon the change of heart that the media has had uh, with the concern about large gatherings. When it comes to a Trump rally, a large gathering is something to be condemned, of course. But when it comes to the protesters who are amassing in the numbers of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands in different cities across America, uh, suddenly the media loses its, in its interest in the coronavirus. So well, even in, we can't in the it, case of protesters, in the case of protesters, we did see a majority of those protesters, A, outdoors, and B, wearing masks at these events, at your event. People were not even so much as encouraged to wear masks, let alone obligated to wear a mask. And even some people working for the campaign, volunteering outside, also were not wearing masks. So if you're planning more indoor events like this in the future, will you at least consider precautions like that, encouraging people or obligating people to wear masks if they're going to be inside? I think maybe you have some bad information because we took uh, a great many precautions that people at protesters uh, didn't even have uh, protests didn't even have access to. Every single person who entered the Trump rally in Tulsa had a temperature check, and if they showed a temperature, they were put off to the side to see if it was because of the outdoor heat, and then tested again. If they showed a temperature, they were not permitted to enter. Every single person who entered the rally was given a mask that they could wear if they want to, and there was also more hand sanitizer than any group of people could ever possibly want to use. None of those precautions were in evidence at any of the demonstrations or protests that we saw across the country, and so I don't think the comparison is fair. I do think some of the protest organizers would disagree with saying that none of those things were present at the protests, but regardless, in an indoor campaign, so you wouldn't consider making it an obligation, let's say, that you have to wear a mask in order to be inside at these events, or if you're working the event, you have to be wearing a mask. Every single person who arrived at the rally and tried to get in, again, had a temperature check and was given a mask. We had many thousands of masks to hand out, and we did that. We gave them to each person. Each person then had the choice to whether or not to wear the mask. And also, I would say, people had the choice to, to attend the rally or not. And, and uh, I think that given the barrage of negative media uh, that led up to the rally and, and uh, the, the, the warnings and the, that uh, a Trump rally was not where you should go by the media, uh, the fact that 12,000 people still showed up really says something about the enthusiasm behind the president's re-election. And we have heard of eight campaign staffers that tested positive for COVID-19 at the rally. Do you know of any more at this time? And do you know how many attendees were turned away during those temperature checks? I don't know how many attendees were turned away, and uh, no, I, I have no further uh, staff positive t tests to report. But uh, the fact is that we detected the staff members who tested positive because of our doing our due diligence in, in conducting tests of, of that manner. And so, uh, once those were detected, we immediately uh, engaged our quarantine and contact tracing protocols here in the campaign. And Tim, the president today is again claiming that mail-in voting will lead to widespread fraud, despite little evidence of fraud in past elections. ABC News has confirmed an AP report that several top Trump officials, including campaign manager Brad Parscale, have voted by mail. So why is the president continuing to cast doubt on this voting method that many Trump officials and the president himself have used in the past, especially given we are in a pandemic? To send every single registered voter a ballot, whether they asked for one or not, is not the same thing. You are absolutely begging for fraud if you just blindly mail every registered voter a ballot without knowing if that person still lives there or is, in fact, still alive. It is an obvious invitation for fraud. So would the campaign then encourage people to request mail-in ballots if they don't intend to make it to the polls? If the laws in their state are such that they can request an absentee ballot, uh, absentee ballot and vote by mail for a reason that they, they say that they can't be at the at the polls on election day, then the, the, those are the laws of their state. And people would be uh, well advised to take advantage and uh, educate themselves of what the laws in their state are. What the Democrats want is to uh, expand that so broadly 
as to mail ballots to every registered voter, whether that voter has requested it or not. It is an obvious invitation for fraud, and it also encourages what's called ballot harvesting, where someone else will go and pick up your ballot and take it and mail it for you. If you had gone to vote in person, actually out the, at the precinct and at the, at the poll on election day, and they said, hey, this person who is a paid partisan official is going to stand next to you and watch you vote. And then that person would take your ballot and while you're not paying attention and not watching, will go and cast your vote for you. And just trust us, that person is going to cast it in the manner that you intended. You would never allow that to happen. But that's exactly what vote harvesting is. People turn over the ballot to someone that they don't know. And then that person, uh, you have to trust that that person will actually mail the ballot for you. That is a wide open invitation for fraud. All right. We unfortunately are out of time. Mr. Murtaugh, Communications Director for the Trump campaign, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now to Minneapolis, where some new allegations are raising eyebrows. Eight minority corrections officers have filed discrimination charges claiming they were barred from guarding or having any contact with former police officer Derek Chauvin. Now, Chauvin is facing murder charges in the death of George Floyd. ABC's Alex Perez has been following this story for us and has the latest. Alex, according to these corrections officers, what exactly were they told? Well, Diane, all eight of these officers have filed a formal complaint with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. And let me set the scene for you. This all unfolded back on May 29th. Former officer Derek Chauvin had just been arrested. He's charged with murdering George Floyd. And he's in the process of being transported over to the Ramsey County Detention Center, the jail there. And that's when these eight corrections officers say they were notified by their boss, the jail superintendent, Steve Lydon, that they needed to move away from the fifth floor be reassigned to a different area. The fifth floor is where Derek Chauvin was headed, a cell on that floor. It wasn't until later that they found out that they were the eight minority officers of color who were on the fifth floor, and their superintendent told them that they were moved to protect them. Now, of course, that did not go over well. Those officers say this incident was not only distressing, but they called it humiliating. In about 45 minutes after making that decision, the superintendent reversed the order uh, and since then has issued a statement that the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office uh, released to the public uh, saying that his intention was to protect and support and not further victimize these correction officers. Now, of course, these officers say they are highly trained, have always done their job exactly the way they were supposed to. So the fact that they were segregated and also treated as if they couldn't do their job because of the color of their skin is highly troubling to them. Diane? And Alex, I know right now these are just allegations, but is this something anecdotally known to happen moving around corrections officers based on their race and the race of the inmate? Well, Diane, all of the research shows that these correction officers are moved based on their behavior at work. And if none of these officers ever showed any behavior that would indicate that they would not be able to guard a high-profile inmate like Derek Chauvin, then they should not have been moved. And that's what investigators, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, is now looking into. These officers say they want to see this superintendent move from his position. They want to see those who help him helped him enforce this order. They want to see those people disciplined, um, and they're not going to stop, they say, through their attorney until these changes are made. And Diane? Alex, now that, that the intendant has, superintendent has issued this statement, the case is filed, where does everything stand now? Yeah, so, Diane, Derek Chauvin has actually been moved to the Hennepin County Jail now, not far from where he was in the Ramsey County Jail, and he's going to be held there until his upcoming court hearing, and that's coming up on June 29th. Diane? All right, Alex Perez from Minneapolis. We appreciate it, Alex. Thanks. And a solemn gathering today in Georgia. Friends and family and many others remembering the life of Rayshard Brooks, who was killed by Atlanta police less than two weeks ago. ABC Steve Osinsami has a closer look at the memorial and the investigation into Brooks's death. People were lined up under the hot Georgia sun to pay their last respects to Rayshard Brooks. His family will bury him tomorrow in Atlanta.
His killing here on June 12th in the parking lot of a Wendy's restaurant at the hands of Atlanta police has divided the city and helped fuel the national movement demanding police reform. Will you take a preliminary breath test for me? Just yes or no. I don't want to refuse anything. It began as a DUI, and when Brooks refused to be put in handcuffs and ran off with one of the officer's tasers, former officer Garrett Rolf is seen shooting him in the back. Rolf's list of charges include felony murder. Officer Devin Brosnan posted bail and is fighting an aggravated assault charge. A witness says he saw one of the officers trying to help Brooks as he was dying and shared this video with ABC News. The officer who he says he saw helping is Rolf. You can tell that one officer was really concerned about Rayshard while the other officer was analyzing the situation. In statements, both officers say their actions were appropriate. Our thanks to Sivos and Sami for that report. When we come back, NASCAR owner Brad Darty joins us to break down today's powerful moment and how the sport is taking a stand against racism. Plus, a shocking move late Friday is raising new questions about independence at the Department of Justice and an investigation into President Trump's associates. And incredible video of a storm blowing in from the desert that could be coming right to your backyard. We'll have details on that in a moment. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. From inside our homes to your home, now is the time. We all just need each other. And that's why we love starting the day together with you. We'll see you in the morning on ABC's Good Morning America. A massive dust plume from the Sahara Desert has been traveling across the Atlantic Ocean and is expected to reach the southeastern U.S. this week. Right now, the giant dust cloud has reached parts of the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico, having a dramatic effect over the skies of Barbados. That country's weather service has issued a severe haze warning and is urging precautions due to reduced visibility and respiratory problems. On the plus side, the dust plume can suppress storm formation and enhance sunrises. So there's that. And now to the Talladega Super Speedway, where there was a powerful show of support for Bubba Wallace today. NASCAR's only full-time black driver was escorted in his car by fellow drivers and crew members to the front of the grid after a noose was found in Wallace's garage yesterday. The incident comes after NASCAR banned the Confederate flag from its events, prompting some protests and acts of defiance. We're going to speak with a NASCAR racing team owner in just a moment, but first let's go to ABC's Victor Okendo with the latest. Tonight at Talladega Super Speedway, an incredible show of solidarity with driver Bubba Wallace before the race. Drivers and pit crews from every team marching along with Wallace's number 43 car. The powerful moment necessary after a noose was found by a team member hanging inside Wallace's garage stall at the track on Sunday. Wallace, the circuit's only full-time black driver, emerging overcome, embracing NASCAR legend and team owner Richard Petty, who called the incident a filthy act. The drivers then bowing their heads in prayer. And as we stand together against racism, by your Holy Spirit, guide us to true liberty and justice for all. Team officials say the noose was found by a member of Wallace's team who immediately reported it. The FBI and the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division now investigating along with NASCAR. You want to make sure that, that Bob is safe and uh, we have stepped up security. Wallace, undaunted, writing, as my mother told me today, they are just trying to scare you. This will not break me. I will not give in, nor will I back down. The hate-fueled attack coming about two weeks after the Confederate flag was banned from all NASCAR events. There's no good that comes with that flag, and that's, that's the message we're kind of trying to get across. That charge for change, boldly led by Wallace, who emblazoned his car with the Black Lives Matter hashtag. Sunday's race was postponed due to bad weather. 5,000 fans were welcome. The Confederate flag was not, but plenty of them outside, and even one flying above, those words reading defund NASCAR. Tonight, these words on the infield. I stand with Bubba. And Victor joins us now. Victor, NASCAR's officials are looking into who placed this noose in that stall. Where does that investigation stand right now? 
Diane, NASCAR officials have said that there are surveillance cameras inside of that garage, and we also know only a limited amount of people would have had that kind of access, fewer than normal because of the coronavirus. NASCAR's president says he wants the people responsible, banned for life. And one more note, whether or not they face federal charges, the Department of Justice saying there's no place for this kind of action. Diane. Victor Kendo from the Homestead Miami Speedway. Our thanks to you, Victor. For more on how NASCAR is grappling with these issues, let's bring in Brad Doherty, the owner of JTG Doherty Racing. He's also an ESPN analyst and a former NBA player. Brad, thanks for being on with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So we've seen some strong messages of support for Bubba Wallace today. How do you think this incident has is affecting the racing community in general? Well, I, I think overall what it does is it gives the uh, opportunity for us all to take a glimpse and, and kind of learn a little bit more about uh, the, the, the little dark underbelly of racism. You know, I, I've got a, I grew up in a small town in Western North Carolina, and the majority of my friends growing up in this little small town were, were Caucasian people, were white. And so most of my best friends in this world are white, and when we talk about race, I'm always trying to talk to them about the subtle things in racism that they just don't quite get. And as we've gotten into the last couple of months with all of the, uh, the activism and people being really, really uh, voicing their opinions and platforms, you know, people still are asking questions. What does racism really look like? We, we kind of know what we saw a few weeks ago in Minnesota, but what are the other things? What are the other symbols of racism? And for someone to get to see this or to hear this today after everything that's going on in our society, I think it's, it, I think it's a great wake up call for all of us to, to see that these things still exist even though we talk about them and uh, they're abhorrent and we're trying to get rid of them and, and push them aside, there's still always that element. A wake-up call is such a great way of putting it. And you've been involved with racing for decades. How do you think this sport has changed over time in terms of its attitude toward race? What does this moment mean for the sport? Do you see that wake-up call in the world of racing? Yeah, I, I think it's been a, uh, a monumental shift what has happened in NASCAR over the last couple of weeks with, you know, the president of, of NASCAR, Steve Phelps, stepping up and basically drawing a line in the sand, something that uh, back in 2015 we talked about. Uh, the then chairman, Brian France, was, was very passionate about removing the Confederate flag from events and venues. And, and there was some talk and there was some theory behind it. And uh, there was some efforts to try and do that. But it just kind of went by the wayside with the, uh, the everyday deals of doing big business. And now we're seeing a, a movement that uh, will not is not going away, first of all. And if you're not a part of this movement, uh, you're going to be left in the wake. And NASCAR has taken a, a huge stance on changing uh, a lot of things, uh, uh, the perception of NASCAR over the last, you know, five decades and, and how people view the sport, what they think of the sport. Uh, this is unprecedented, and this is huge. And uh, they continue, uh, NASCAR continues to make statements and react uh, in a manner that uh, I'm proud to be a member of NASCAR at this point. And NASCAR is not the only league asking itself these kinds of tough questions. I know you played in the NBA. You've covered basketball for many years as well. Some players there are thinking of foregoing the rest of the season, both out of concerns over health, but some are now saying also over issues of race in this country. What's your advice to those players? What we see today with the young athletes, men and women, uh, they have tremendous platforms. They have the, 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 the largest platforms uh, in the world to get messages out, to be positive and change. And so I'm asking all these young men and young women uh, to be responsible, uh, to, to offer some solutions. Don't just get caught up in a movement without actually having some concrete foundational uh, solutions that you can offer people in order to help. Uh, everyone at this point in time is yelling and screaming and doing all kinds of things, and that's great. We all should have our voices be heard. But I'm the type of person, I'm starting to look for uh, what's the change? How do we change, you know, hundreds of years of history and, and, and hundreds of years of oppression and those types of things. And Brad, so much of what you're talking about is communication, and I do want to go back to that. I know you're partnering with P&G to help educate people about racial inequality in the U.S. How do you go about having these sometimes uncomfortable conversations, and how do you open up that kind of meaningful dialogue that you're describing with a topic that so many people are afraid to even touch? Yeah. 
that, that's the biggest problem in our world today or in our society today. Uh, just having a good conversation with a, uh, a Caucasian buddy of mine I grew up with. We were just talking about this 30 minutes ago. Uh, the reality of it is, is that we live in such a politically correct society. We can't have conversations about these things. Uh, and it's, it's sad. We can talk about race and we will talk about race until the, the, the cows come home. But uh, until I can have a conversation on how I see things and not be pushed into a politically correct corner and and when we can have discussions as black or african-american males about our uh our role in our communities and our responsibilities and those types of things um uh, it'll never go away so we have to be able to push the left side of the politics off the table the right side of the politics off the table sit down as people and, and cultivate some ideas and topics and, and speak to one another from the heart respectfully. Uh, political correctness is, has wiped that off the boards and it's gonna be difficult because uh, without communication, you don't get much. So uh, going to the website I spoke of earlier at pg.com backslash take on race. It, it, there's some tools there, some interesting tools, uh, interesting educational opportunities. We need more of that. And at the end of the day, we need forums. We need to sit down and have, have these very deep conversations about who we are, uh, where we're going, and how we get there together. Well, we certainly appreciate everything that you're doing to open up those conversations. And Brad, we very much appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. And up next, the shocking numbers on gun violence and how things could be getting worse. Plus, one of the biggest museums in the country is taking down a statue of Theodore Roosevelt. But first, our tweet of the day, Bubba Wallace with a message of togetherness. We'll be right back. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, Americans continue to fight the epidemic of gun violence. We take a closer look at what appears to be a recent uptick in deadly shootings by the numbers. In Chicago alone, 102 people were shot over the weekend. 14 of these shootings were fatal. Chicago has seen a 33% increase in shootings compared to last year, although overall crime is slightly down in that city. 51 people were shot in New York City this past week, and 12 people were shot shot in Minneapolis in just one incident on Sunday. Nationwide, there have been 7,834 deadly shootings so far this year, according to the Gun Violence Archive. This does not include gun-related suicides. And there have been 221 mass shootings in 2020, meaning shootings with four or more victims not including the shooter. We've already seen 66 mass shootings so far in June alone, the most ever recorded in a single month since the Gun Violence Archive started recording that statistic in 2013. Law enforcement experts have been predicting an unusually violent summer because of the toxic combination of virus fears, economic troubles, and increased drug and alcohol abuse during the shutdown. And experts say shootings are on the rise, not just in big cities, but also in some small towns as well.
Coming up, as all parents know, any plan to get back to normal has to start with child care and making sure our kids are well taken care of. But should the government be doing more to help? Plus, if you're looking for a tan, have you thought about visiting Siberia? Temperatures in the normally frozen wasteland are now topping 100 degrees. But first, here are some of the trending headlines on abcnews.com. Right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So, this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. Now, this is ABC see. News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, it's a major. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you very much. Thank you. from health officials with the country reopening and at least 22 states seeing an increase in cases, 12 setting daily records. A new model shows Florida could become the country's new epicenter. In this chart of Miami, you can see projected cases skyrocketing in July. More than half of the cases reported on Saturday were under 35 years old. What we've seen is an increasingly troubling trend of cases that have been continuing to escalate. New York City, the country's former epicenter, entering phase two of reopening today. That includes outdoor dining, salons, barber shops, and more retail stores. Today is a very, very important day for this city. In New York, an NYPD officer is suspended without pay after a video shows what the police commissioner called an apparent chokehold. That is a banned practice. The incident taking place during a confrontation with a teen suspect over the weekend. The suspension came within hours of the video being posted to social media. The coronavirus affecting one more thing, the Hajj. That's a pilgrimage that about 2 million Muslims take every year to Saudi Arabia's holy city of Mecca. It's going to look a lot different this year. Saudi Arabian officials announced now only a limited number of worshippers will be allowed. The decision comes just five weeks before the Hajj is supposed to take place. In New York City, the statue of President Theodore Roosevelt on horseback will be removed from the outside of the Museum of Natural History. The statue shows the president with a Native American and an African American on foot next to him. The museum received a request for its removal because it, quote, explicitly depicts black and indigenous people as subjugated and racially inferior. Mayor de Blasio says that he supports the museum's decision to remove the statue. Statue has representations that are clearly do not uh, represent today's values. Uh, the statue clearly you know, presents a white man as superior to people of color. And that's just not acceptable in this day and age. At this point, there's no word yet on when the statue will be removed or where it will go. The $10 found a father without a father 
If you missed your shot to see Hamilton on Broadway, now you can be in the room where it happens, your living room. Teasing Hamilton's arrival to the small screen, our parent company dropping a new trailer for its July 3rd debut on Disney+. Plus. Creative mastermind Lin-Manuel Miranda gave GMA insight on the process. All day Monday, we filmed close-ups and steady cam and all the coverage you would want to get in a movie uh, on our day off on Monday. Continuing to film Tuesday morning all the way to another live show uh, Tuesday night with all the cameras in the audience in different positions. Welcome back. Take a look at this summer day on the lake. Might look like a fairly unremarkable shot until you realize this is in the Arctic Circle, the Siberian town of Rukoyansk, normally referred to as the Pole of the Cold. It hit 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit this weekend, which would make it the hottest day on record for that region ever. Siberia has one of the world's harshest climates with temperatures that can dip as low as negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Today's temps dropped into the positive 90s. The average June high for that town is 68. We turn now to the Justice Department shakeup that's causing an uproar. Over the weekend, President Trump and Attorney General Bill Barr fired Manhattan's top federal prosecutor, Jeffrey Berman. Now, Berman was overseeing several cases involving allies to the president, including Rudy Giuliani. That office also has jurisdiction over a lot of Trump's business empire, which is headquartered in New York. So for more on the fallout, we bring in ABC's Kira Phillips. Kira, Berman didn't exactly go quietly this weekend. How did this all go down, and what is he saying now? Well, that's for sure. And also, Berman says, Diane, that he didn't even see this coming and was actually informed of his attempted ouster via a press release where Attorney General Bill Barr said Berman was, quote, stepping down. Well, not so, according to Berman. So he released a statement of his own saying that he didn't resign, that he had no intention of resigning, and that all the investigations involving the president's allies will still move forward without delay or any interruptions, Diane. So what's the final verdict? Is he out? Is he in? Is he interim until a replacement <laughs> is named? There was a lot of back and forth. Exactly. And, you know, the president has the right um, to fire whoever he wants, but he can't obstruct justice either. And critics here say that this move by Barr to replace Berman is being seen as a way just to make those ongoing investigations surrounding Trump and his allies disappear. But the standoff continues. Uh, he's not going anywhere. And it's raising questions about Bill Barr and these perceived tactics to control his department in a way that helps suit President Trump's political agenda. So we'll follow the standoff and see what happens, Diane. All right. It's definitely an interesting one to watch. Kira Phillips, we appreciate it. Thanks. You bet. And now to a crisis that impacts working parents across the country. Child care centers are an essential but often overlooked part of our economy, and they are in trouble. Experts predict many won't make it. So should the government be doing more to help? ABC's Karen Travers has this report. So I am here at my daughter's daycare, and um, that's it. You know, they're closing. Diana Lamangi says she is heartbroken. She couldn't hold back her emotion as she packed up her three-year-old daughter's things from her now-closed child care center. It's a beautiful space, and um, both my kids went here, so I'm really, really sad. Lamangi and many working parents are learning firsthand a tough reality. The coronavirus pandemic is pushing the nation's child care industry to the brink of collapse. Child care is a top concern for millions of working parents. If you have to go back to the office and your child care center is closed, what do you do? Experts say this is a key piece of the puzzle to fully reopening the U.S. economy. Child care is in a crisis moment right now. Nationwide, nearly half of child care providers completely closed their facilities during the COVID-19 shutdowns, according to research cited by child care experts. Of those that stayed open, 85% are operating with less than half of their usual child enrollment. The outlook for the industry is grim. One study found that roughly half of U.S. childcare capacity is at risk of disappearing. There is no way that the economy will be able to open completely without childcare being fully supported and stable. People talk about the airlines industry, they talk about restaurants, they talk about meat processing plants, but they don't talk about all the people who go to work every day and need childcare. Circle Time is a childcare center in Kensington, Maryland. It's stayed open during the COVID-19 shutdowns because it serves essential workers. 
but their numbers went from a full enrollment of 78 children to, at one point, just nine. Owner Gigi Serrano says a key reason she can stay afloat, every family paid full tuition for April, and some are still paying half, even if their children are at home. We sent out an email just asking parents to pay what they could in order to hold their spots if they weren't coming in. Again, several of our families were incredible. A few even paid extra, and I feel like that was to help the families that maybe couldn't contribute as much. Melissa Joy's two sons went back to circle time after spending three months at home. She says she's had a lot of discussions with other parents about how to support the center. They've always been there for us. We've tried to be there for them. Serrano says so far she has not been forced to lay off any staff, crediting a loan she received through the federal government's Paycheck Protection Program. The circle time staff is more fortunate than most. Roughly one third of child care workers have been laid off since March, including Martha Rodriguez, who worked as a bilingual instructional assistant at a preschool in Renton, Washington. I'm not sure uh, if I'm going to back to work really soon because I'm not a essential essential person in the classroom. Child care centers are expensive to operate. Experts say they are already working around very thin margins, often taking in just enough to cover their operating costs. Most don't have a rainy day fund for a crisis like this. We have our Clorox and water. Now throw in the additional costs of the new normal in the coronavirus pandemic, PPE, sanitizer, deep cleanings. And we have our infrared thermometer. Parents like Diana Lamangi, who finds themselves scrambling for child care say the federal government needs to step up and help working families. If we don't have child care, we can't work. It's as simple as that. The $2 trillion CARES Act, a federal COVID-19 relief package, included nearly $60 billion for the airline industry. But just $3.5 billion was set aside for child care providers. Democratic Senator Patty Murray tells us that is not good enough. Most of them are saying we can't survive, we can't reopen, we can't keep going without additional funding. Proudly calling herself the only former preschool teacher in the U.S. Senate, Murray introduced legislation to put $50 billion in federal funding toward this critical industry. I'm just saying to my fellow colleagues, just ask any friend you have with kids, what is their biggest issue right now, and this is it. More than 90% of the nation's 1.2 million child care workers are women. Some experts say that is a key reason the industry is undervalued and taken for granted. It's something that people just assume will always be there. History has shown that it sometimes takes a crisis to force Washington to rethink its priorities. We have been ambivalent about child care in this country for so long. Um, we cannot do that anymore. We have to treat this like a public good. Gigi Sorrell is feeling okay right now, but I asked her, how long can circle time hang on without help? We'll probably be good until about September, but beyond that, it's really just going to depend how many of our families are still able to work, how many of them are still able to contribute to holding a spot, because this is a long time. It's a long time to ask families to contribute when there's really no actual end date. Karen Travers for ABC News Live in Kensington, Maryland. When we come back... This is one way to exercise safely in the age of COVID-19. The story behind this strange picture in a moment. From inside our homes to your home, now is the time. We all just need each other. And that's why we love starting the day together with you. We'll see you in the morning on ABC's Good Morning America. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor. Overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Where's yours? What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age! 
little throwback there to the 1997 movie Batman and Robin in honor of its director, Joel Schumacher, who died today. In addition to directing two Batman films, the movie director was best known for films like The Lost Boys and St. Elmo's Fire. Friends are remembering his talent, creativity, and kindness. He died after a year-long battle with cancer. Joel Schumacher was 80 years old. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Talk about hot yoga. Take a look at this yoga class in Toronto. LMNTS Outdoor Studios set up 50 plastic domes so that people could practice their sun salutations and their social distancing as well. And that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us, everyone. Stay safe.